So I'd like to share a little bit how I got here today. I had to set up an alarm at 5.30. I had to snooze it several times before I woke up. After that, I took my dog for a walk, and I like to listen to some music while I do this. Huge trans fan, by the way. After I finished walking my dog, I had to check my calendar so I know exactly where I need to be so I don't go on the wrong stage. And lastly, I had to check my bus schedule. And I realized I was late. So I ran real fast. And I made it. It's funny, my wife still thinks I'm a runner. And actually, I am. I run every day to catch the bus. <laughs> and good morning, everyone. My name is Charmaine De Silva, and I'm a product manager on Android. Like Sweat, I spend my days running to meetings. Some days I get to travel to meet all of you and find my way through new cities. And after all the excitement of my days, I get to say goodnight to my boys before I end my day with my favorite TV shows. Of course, my favorite TV shows have dragons these days. Now, pausing to think about both our stories, you must have guessed by now that all of this was achieved on our smartphones. But our stories are in no way unique. Every day, billions of people around the world use the applications that you have built to connect with people around the world and do incredible things. However, our users tell us that they want more transparency and control over their data. They expect Android as a platform to give them tools for that transparency and control. This responsibility to our users is something that we've all taken very seriously. And that's why we're here today. We're here to talk to you about the new privacy features in Android Q and how you can leverage them to build privacy-forward apps. Over the years, Android has matured. We've added a wide range of features to protect our users like file-based encryption, runtime permissions, lockdown mode, Google Play Protect, and many more. On Android, we embrace privacy as a way to innovate. And Android has always been designed with security and privacy at its core. In Android Q, we wanted to go farther. We added almost 50 features related to privacy and security. So these features are designed to, pr to provide more protection, user control, and transparency. To develop these features, we worked very closely with many of you. We shared our ideas, our designs, our prototypes. We heard your feedback, and we embedded this back into our products. We couldn't have done this without you. So thank you all so much. As Sweat mentioned, you spent countless of hours with us through workshops, filing bugs, and testing our betas, helping us understand the issues you face and enabling us to serve you better. We will continue to build apps that matter. None of this could have been possible without all of you all. Thank you all for your support. We're so grateful to have developers like you help us build a better platform. So now we want to help you build privacy-first apps that delight your users. Through the rest of this journey, we will share with you best practices and introduce you to the new features in Android Q. Let's get started. So starting with permissions, as you already know, applications run in their own sandboxes. So your application to, to access user data needs to request specific permissions. In Android 6.0, we introduced the concept of runtime permissions. This allows your application at runtime to prompt the user for accessing private data. And the user can choose to deny or approve the request. As Sweat mentioned, users have the ability to approve or deny requests. We're always curious to understand what users do with our devices. 
When we survey our users to understand why they actually deny permission, these are the top three reasons we see. One, the app should not need the permission. Two, they expect the app to still work without the permission. And three, they feel like they can grant the permission later. All of this tells us one thing. Users who deny permissions do not understand the value when the app is asking for it. With this in mind, let's talk about how best to deal with permissions. OK, step one, determine if there are alternate APIs to give you the data that you need. If they are alternate APIs, choose to use them instead of asking for a permission. Alternate APIs tend to be narrower in scope, which makes them a better privacy choice. Let's go through a few examples. Let's assume your app needs to do SMS verification. Instead of asking for the SMS runtime permission, you can instead use the SMS Retriever API. SMS verification is a common use case for which developers ask for the SMS permission. Fortunately, Google Play Services has dedicated API for exactly this use case. The entry point is the SMS Retriever client, and the main method is start SMS Retriever. Here's another example. What if your app needs to know if the user was in a phone call? Instead of asking for the read phone state permission, you can instead call the audio focus API to see call state. Detecting the whether the user is in a phone call is a common reason apps are asking for the phone permission. But there is a better way. You can use the audio focus API. If the user is currently in a phone call, you will not be able to gain audio focus. All you need to remember is to use the audio manager compat and request audio focus method. Last example. What if your app needed access to external storage? You do not necessarily need to ask for the read external storage permission. You can instead leverage your app's private app storage or use a system file picker. Apps often request the storage permission without taking advantage of their dedicated folder on external storage which does not require holding the read and write storage permission. The way you get this folder is a con you call contacts, context get external files there. Also, the, the system provides ways for you to bring trusted system UI for the user to pick a file or directory so you can work with it. The way you can bring the file chooser UI is to fire the action open document. And the way to bring the UI to pick a folder is to fire the action open document tree. These are just a few examples how you can use APIs without asking for permissions to provide better user experience. Please go to the Android developer website to learn more. OK, so now you've done your research and realized there are no alternative APIs to give you the data that you need. You're now at step two, determining the scope of the permission and how you'd ask for it. In speaking to many developers like yourself, you all believe that you will get higher acceptance rate if you ask for permissions up front. However, when we poll our users, we see that only 18% of users accept every permission of their device. Most users make deliberate choices. Now that I think about it, I'm one of those people that always approves permissions. But if I think a little bit more, I do it only if I understand the use case and there is an immediate value for me as a user if I grant their permission. And Sweat's experience is not like, unlike our users. When we ask a user why they choose to give an app access to a permission, the top reason they say is because they wanted to use a specific feature of an app. This tells us that they were intentional with their choice. Users are more likely to give your app access to a permission if they understand the purpose and the perceived benefit feels logical. Let's go through examples of where the benefit of the random permission is very clear. So if the, if the context is clear, ask for the permission directly. And this way, the user will know exactly why the permission is needed. They have context. There is an immediate value for the user. And there is a higher probability of the user granting the permission to the application, thus using your feature. For example, if you're in a chat application, 
and you want to share a photo, and you click the camera button, the user will not be surprised if they're asked for the camera permission. And they'll probably grant you the permission because they want to use your feature. So in this scenario that Sweat ran you through, the use case is pretty obvious. But that's not always the case. There are situations where you need to educate the user of your feature benefit before the runtime prompt is shown. It's better to present the use case right before the runtime prompt. Here's an example from Nest's Home Away Assist feature. This dialog precedes the location runtime prompt. In Android P, this is what the location runtime prompt looks like. The user choice is binary. Users can choose to either approve or deny the location request. If a user provides location permission to an app, the app could now access location in the foreground or in the background. In Android Q, we're introducing more granular controls to the app. Users can give the, give the app the choice to have only foreground access to the location or foreground and background access to location. As an app developer, only ask for background app access if you only have a clear need for it. Now that the location permission can be requested while in access and all the time, you need to choose the right scope that best fits your feature. Our recommendation is, whenever possible, use while-in-use location. The way you ask for while-in-use location is exactly the same. You ask for location, as always. You ask for the course or find location permission. However, if you want to access location in the background, you need to add an additional modifier permission called access background location. So this permission needs to be combined with the existing find and course location permissions. And this is a signal to the platform to show UI to the user where they have choices between while in use, all the time, and deny the request. Scope is also relevant to storage. In Android Q, we add in the concept of scoped storage. Scoped storage provides better application data isolation and also protects the collections of videos and, and uh, audio. Later today, we have another talk which goes very like in details. Uh, and please attend that. OK, so now at this point, you've got your apps get runtime permissions. You now have a responsibility to user data. Step three, ensure users are not surprised with your data usage. Here are some best practices. One, collect only the data that you need. Two, only share the data once you get explicit user consent. Three, if you're transferring data off the device, ensure that it is encrypted and secure. Four, only keep data for as long as you need it. By following these best practices, your users will feel more comfortable with how their data is being used by your application. Now, this concludes our section on permissions. Let's talk through other areas in Android Q. Now that we finished with permissions, another area we focused our attention was device identifiers. In Android Q, we're locking down hardware-based device identifiers. So instead, you need to, instead of hardware device identifiers, you need to use software-based, user-resettable device identifiers. This is much more privacy-friendly solution. We are also randomizing MAC address. This feature shipped in Android P as an experimental feature under developer options, where we use different random MAC address when, we connect, when the device connects to different networks. Now we're bringing this feature mainstream, available to all apps all the time. Another area we focused on was app launching and notifications. This area is important to build user trust so that users feel like they're in control of their device. Apps launched into the foreground can sometimes feel intrusive and disruptive to the user experience. Notification APIs can be used to notify the users without interrupting their user flow. There are two main benefits. One, the users maintain context. And two, do not disturb rules are actually maintained. For cases of alarms and incoming calls, 
you can ensure a full screen experience when the device is locked, or a heads up notification, like in this example, when the device is in use. This avoids completely interrupting the user. So I'll explain to you how you can implement this in your app. So the recommended way to involve the user is to use the notification API you're all familiar with. The only thing to remember is the set full screen intent API, which allows you to set an intent which will be fired off if the user is not actively using the device. So if the device is locked, the user will see a full screen experience. If the user is currently using the device, they will see the heads up notification Charmaine mentioned. And this will not interrupt the user flow while still letting the user know there is something requiring their attention. In Android Q, background app launching will be blocked. Apps will no longer be able to launch themselves from the background to the foreground. This ensures that users are appropriately interrupted and respects their context and do not disturb settings. We're now on our last leg of our journey, foreground services. Foreground services are a lightweight way to run an application when it is not visible in the foreground. But foreground services can be noisy. Try to limit your use of foreground services to tasks that are a continuation of an ongoing activity, like navigation. To improve the user experience, in Android Q, we're introducing the concept of service types. And we'll be limiting permission usage based on the service type. For example, if your application has while in use location permission, and you want to use location in a foreground service, you need to annotate your service as being location type. The way you do this is using the foreground service type attribute in the declaration in the manifest of your service. And if you don't do this, you will not get location delivered to your application in, while this service is running. So we've covered a lot of privacy features and best practices, and there is a lot more you can learn on the Android developer website. If you want to learn more about these features, please attend these other privacy sessions, or come talk to us in the sandbox. Thank you all for joining us today and giving us this opportunity to work together. Let's continue the conversation and keep building privacy forward apps. Thank you all.